All right, we are in a series. Guess what it is called? Heaven. How many of you heard of that place? How many of you want to go to that place? Absolutely, man. I'm all about it. We are in this series, and I hopefully, hopefully, I have answered some of your questions that you've had about heaven and eternity and all that. Now, with that being said, today we're going to keep going into this a little bit deeper. And I will even tell you that some of what you may hear today may be somewhat you've heard before over the last couple weeks because I'm going to retread some of that stuff. But it's only because the way I have my message laid out this week and the way I want to talk about it. Because I want to talk about this. What happens at the moment you pass away, what happens from that moment on? Have you ever wondered that? What happens time-wise, wise, you, you know, time-wise, chronologically, what happens? What happens? Well, um, Boudreaux, Boudreaux and Thibodeau, y'all know who Boudreaux and Thibodeau is? Crazy Cajuns from Louisiana? All right, well, Boudreaux, Boudreaux dies and he goes to heaven. And when he gets there, he is assigned to help Peter. Peter is in charge of the pearly gates, and he's standing up there, and he is in charge, Peter is, letting people in heaven. So people would walk up there to the pearly gates, and Peter would be standing there, and, and Peter would say, you know, what, uh, or I'm sorry, the person would say, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And Peter would simply look at him and say, it's very simple, spell love. And the person would say, L-O-V-E, and Peter would say, very good. You can enter into the kingdom of God. So the first person goes by. Next person walks up to the pearly gates, says, what do I need to do to get into heaven? Peter looks at him and says, all you have to do is spell love. L-O-V-E, Peter lets him in. A lady walks up and says, what do I need to do to get into heaven? Peter says, spell love. L-O-V-E, walks right into the kingdom of heaven. There it is. Boudreaux had had enough of this. He said, you know what, I could do Peter's job. So he says, hey, Peter, won't you take a break and I'm going to take over. So Boudreaux takes over the pearly gates. Somebody walks up, gentleman walks up and says, hey, what do I need to do to get into heaven? Boudreaux said, it ain't no problem. Spell love, L-O-V-E. Boudreaux says, very good, you can enter into the kingdom of God. The lady walks up to the pearly gates, says, what do I need to do to get into heaven? Boudreaux said, no problem, all you have to do is spell love. L-O-V-E, walks into the pearl, through the pearly gates and into heaven. Another dude walks up, what do I need to do? Boudreaux says, spell love, L-O-V-E, boom, in heaven, right? Then Cleo, Boudreaux's wife, walks up. <laughs> says, Boudreaux, what do I need to do to get into heaven? Boudreaux says, very simple, very easy. All you got to do is spell supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> I'll let you in. She goes, that's all right, Boudreaux, because I wouldn't have let you in either. <laughs> How many of you know that is not happening in heaven? How many of you know Boudreaux ain't running the pearly gates? How many of you know the only way you're getting to heaven is through a relationship with Jesus Christ and him alone? Amen? I believe that with all my heart. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Well, today we're going to talk about what happens immediately after you die. Immediately after you die. Immediately after you die. Here's one thing is for sure. You ready? You are either going to go by way of death or you're going to go by way of the rapture. How many of you want to go with the rapture? Man, I do. I'm not buying no gravestone very soon. Not at all. Why? I'm believing God to go in the rapture. Some of you may not know what the rapture is, but the rapture is the principle that there is coming a time where the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ rise first. We will be caught up in the middle of the air to meet the Lord forever, and we'll be with the Lord forever. Excuse me for a second. No doubt about it. I believe in that. I believe it's going to happen. All right? So now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the first part, part of my message as far as the rapture and kind of explain a little bit of that. Here's what it says. I, don't, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Notice this. The Apostle Paul uses the words fallen asleep. Why? Because in his world and in our world, we should not look as laying down this physical body as death. Why? How many of you know we have eternal life in Christ? Yeah. Right. So we're not going to die. Right. We're just going to lay down this body. And we're going to keep on living, praise God. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Look at this next part. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again. How many of we believers we got? 
All right, we believe Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Christ. Those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, those who have passed away, gone on to be with heaven, God is bringing back with him. Now, what's, what, what's going to happen? Here it is. For this we say to, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who, have, uh, who are asleep. Now, I'm going to read all this, and now I'm going to bring it all together. Look at this. For the Lord himself will descend with the heaven from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead which are in Christ will rise, what? First, absolutely. Look at the next verse. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the what? With the Lord. Last verse, here we go. Therefore comfort one another with these what? With these words. Let me just explain to you what's going to happen. If we don't make it to death, which I'm believing for the rapture, Okay, if we go by way of the rapture, the Bible says here's what's going to happen. The trump of God is going to sound. We which are alive will be caught up to meet the other believers who are already in the air. They are in the air. They are being translated. They were receiving their new glorified bodies. We who are on the earth will be caught up together to meet them in the air, and we will have all of us at the same time will receive our glorified bodies instantly. So people in heaven do not have a glorified body yet. They're waiting for it. They can't wait for the rapture too. So we all get glorified bodies at the same time. They say, well, Pastor Charlie, that's all cool, but what happens the moment if I don't go in the rapture? If you don't go in the rapture, guess what? I'm going to tell you exactly, and I'm going to give it to you step by step. Because I know sometimes when you come to church, and you hear me talking, and I talk about the millennial reign, and then I talk about the judgment seat, and then I talk about the Bema judgment, and I talk about all these things. Sometimes I'm sure you sit there and your head's spinning. So today I want to make it very, very crystal clear as far as the chronological order in which the path will be. All right, so here we go. Number one, you ready? Here it is. Your last breath. <sighs> what happens? Here it is. You ready? Number one, angels will usher you into heaven. As soon as you breathe, matter of fact, if you've ever been around, and I've had the privilege and responsibility of being around people oftentimes in their last moments, and they will tell you people will actually begin to see angels around them. And I believe with all my heart, what they are actually beginning to see is the angels that are waiting to escort them. They are seeing those angels as get, getting ready to escort them. So your last breath, the angels are there, and you're going to go, they're going to go, hi, and you're going to go, hi. <laughs> That's how it's going to be, man. I'm telling you. I, I, it's going to be just like that. You're going to be like, ah, hi, and they're going to go, hi. That's it. Like, well, isn't there something bigger? No, that's it. Say, well, Pastor Charlie, what happens next? Oh, I tell you, it gets better and better as we go through today, man. It gets better and better. Because your last breath immediately, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have an immediate Enter into God's presence. You immediately feel God's presence. You know, I know in, during our worship service, some people worship, some people don't. That's not, I think you should worship because that's how you, you, you stir it up on the inside of you. But listen, here's the truth. The truth of the matter is, we only experience God's presence to a certain level on this planet. But at, at your death, when you die, you breathe your last breath, I'm telling you, there is an overwhelming sense of God's presence that comes over you. Because you are completely now under the authority and rule of God. Completely. So your last breath, <sighs> angels, hi. Next thing, man, God's presence just pours over you. Pours over you. You feel love. You feel accepted. You feel wanted. You feel all the things that maybe you've struggled with in your lifetime. I'm telling you, God breaks those things off immediately, instantly. I mean, I think about all the things that in a worship service that, have fall, that has fallen off of me in my life. I tell you, that, is, that, is, that fails to even compare what God's going to do instantly at the moment that you pass away. God's going to break all that stuff off of you. All that depression, all that worry, all that anxiety, all that fear. Listen, you may struggle with it till you go, go home to be with the Lord. Now, I'm praying that you don't because the Word of God says you don't have to. But I promise you at your last breath, boom, it breaks off. 
<gasps> Hi, bam, God's presence is there. Flood you. Say, what happens next, Pastor Charlie? All right, you go north. You go north. Say, how'd I get that? I'm going to show you. I believe with all my heart the Bible tells you which direction you're going to head. And I believe not only does the Bible bear it out, but science actually confirms the Bible. <gasps> Imagine that. It really does. It cracks me up. People, matter of fact, I was in a conversation just the other day, and someone said, well, you know, I'd believe the Bible, but, it, but, but science contradicts it. I said, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You just hang around dumb scientists. <laughs> Go hang around some smart ones, and I promise you, you'll find some people that believe the Word of God. You, they believe the Word of God. All right? So get this. You go north. How do I know that? Check this out. This is Leviticus one eleven. Now, how many of you remember the old sacrifice system? Under the old covenant, they had to sacrifice animals, right? All right, now I want you to see something here. It says, you shall kill it on the north side. How many north enders? How many of you kill it on the north side? That meant something totally different when I was a kid. You shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the who? Before the Lord. Now, everybody look at me and check this out. How many of you know God is omniscient? God knows all things. How many of you know God's omnipresent? He, he's everywhere at all times. Right? Okay, now watch. It isn't that God couldn't see him on the south side of the building. Y'all hearing me? It wasn't that God couldn't see him on the east or the west side. Right? God was trying to prove a point. That when you sacrifice to the Lord, you're going to do it to the north. Why? That's the direction of God's throne. That's the direction of God's presence, to the north. I've had people ask him, hey, when you die, where are you going? Up. Okay, here's the problem with up. Up now, 12 hours from now, is down. <laughs> so you get that later. Yeah, you'll go home and look at a globe and be like, oh, I get it. I get it. No, here's the truth. You're not going up, you're going north. Because how many of you know no matter where you're at on this planet, north is always north? Absolutely. Now, you say, Pastor Charlie, that's kind of a weak argument. Oh, I got more. I got more. I got more. Check this out. Psalms 75, 6. Check this out. For exaltation, some verses or some translations say for promotion. For promotion or exaltation comes neither from the, help me out, east nor the nor the Okay, what which direction is missing? North. The north is missing. Why? Because the Bible says promotion number 1 comes from the Lord. And number 2 it comes from the from the north. Absolutely. Because that's where God is. Now, check this one out. This is pretty cool. This is Isaiah 14, okay? Now, this is Lucifer in God. God is telling you what happened to Lucifer and why he was kicked out of heaven. Here it is. For you have said in your heart, this is God speaking of Satan, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into where? Heaven. Where is that? Where God is, right? I will ascend into heaven, the third heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the the sides of the north. Where is God's throne? To the north. Absolutely. Get this. Job 26, 7 says this. He stretches out the north over the empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. This is a phenomenal verse. Get this. You may or may not know that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. The oldest book in the Bible. If you were here during my Twisted series, I explained a lot of this. But Job is the oldest book in the Bible. If you were reading the Bible chronologically, you would start out with the book of Job. All right, now get this. Whenever it comes to the book of Job, and Job, specifically Job 26, he stretches out the north over the empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. There are two phenomenal scientific facts in this verse. Scientific. Not, not biblical, although they are biblical, they are scientific. What are they? Number one, well, I'll just give them both to you. Ready? Here they are. Northern empty space, did you see that in that verse? And the earth is hung on nothing. Whenever you talk to scientists, you ask them, what holds the earth in its place? They'll say, well, gravity. Okay, what's holding gravity in its place? They say nothing. Right. Why? Because the Bible says that God upholds, Jesus himself upholds the universe by the word of his power. He spoke it and it was. He said, earth be, bam! 
That's what happened. And anything he wants done, he speaks it and it's done. His word is so powerful that it does that. How many of you know you were creating, created in his image and likeness and your words matter too? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you got to watch what you say because your words have power. Listen to this. The universe. There is an empty place or a void in the north part of our universe. It was, the fir it was first discovered with a 200-inch long uh, telescope, Mount Polymer, in Mount Palomar, California, and is now being studied by three separate observatories across the country. This empty place has been found to be so large that it could contain 2,000 Milky Ways. Not, not the candy bar. <laughs> not the, I know, like 2,000 Milky Ways, how much is that? No, I think I could put that in my truck. No. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 Milky Way galaxies. 2,000 Milky Way galaxies. Say, how large is the Milky Way galaxy? Here's a reference point. The Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. 100,000 light years across. Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Watch this. That, would take, that means it would take light traveling at 186,000 miles per second. Uh, it would take 100,000 years for it to travel from one end of the Milky Way to the other end. And there are 2,000, a space for 2,000 Milky Ways. I don't know how to expl explain it except to they th say this. That's stinking huge, man. <laughs> it's huge. It's vast. It's phenomenally vast. It is possible that heaven is located in the northern part of our universe. That's from a scientist. Not from Bible. I didn't get that out of the Bible. That's not a Bible verse. That's what scientists say. I truly believe that north is exactly where heaven's at. I believe the Bible bears it out, that north. So, here it is. You ready? <sighs> Hi, angels, right? Overwhelming God's presence. You start moving in what direction? North. You're flying at the speed of light. Yo, you go. <laughs> I love it. I'm excited about it. Here's the truth. You ready? You will have your conscience. You'll have your conscience. You will have your mind. You will, you'll be totally aware of who you are, what you did, who, you, who you're related to, who your family is, what's going on. You will be completely understood in understanding who you are. You will have self-awareness. You'll know who you are. You'll know, wow. Some of you, you know, maybe you've lost a limb or had a friend love. Men, as soon as it happens, that limb will be there. They'll be like, wow. You know, your body will probably, nice. And, wow. I mean, it's going to be awesome, man. Immediately, your conscience will be a w really alert. Some people think, you know, I've heard people say, well, when we get to heaven, will we know anything? Man, you're going to know a whole lot more than what you know now. I don't know why people think that you're going to go to heaven and get dumb. All right, you're as dumb as you're ever going to be here on this planet, all right, y'all? Okay? <laughs> you're getting sm Well, not everybody, but you should be getting smarter as you live on this planet, praise God. <laughs> all right, so your conscience, you will have your conscience. You'll be very aware. You'll have thoughts, feelings, emotions. You'll have all those things. Next thing. You will be able to see and communicate with other believers in heaven immediately when you get there. You'll be able to see them. I, know, I don't know about you, but I look forward to seeing my dad died of a drug overdose. I'm going to kick him in his shin when I get there. Um, in love, because there's no hate in heaven. So I'm going to do it in love. Uh, but, but I'm going to see my dad. I look forward to seeing my grandparents, my grandma. I look forward to seeing people that have been in our church that have passed away that I loved, you know. People that I pastored for years. I, I imagine there are going to be people that I pastored that I, I didn't know, but I've done their funerals. I've done people's funerals that, that I didn't even know them. And, uh, and they'll walk up, hey, you did my funeral. Really? I, I tell you, it's going to be awesome. You're going to be able to see your loved ones, see the people that you love, see the people. This week, I, I, uh, actually yesterday, I had to do a funeral for a two-month, two-day-old baby. Terrible thing, terrible thing. And while I was there, you know, immediately I opened up with the idea that, you know, listen to this. God didn't do this. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? Jesus came to give us life. God is the God of life. He is the life giver. 
Amen? All right? So let's not confuse the lines here. Now, we stand here today at a funeral of a two-month-old baby because the choices of Adam and Eve and sin is on the earth. But there should be something in you that says this should not be. And you know what? That's right. It shouldn't be. There should be something on the inside of you that says this is wrong. And that's right, because it is wrong. You were not made for that. That is sin in the earth. Whenever we see our loved ones in heaven, we'll never have that feeling again, ever again, of that wrong, of that, man, this isn't right, or why is this? Or even if, I don't care how old your grandparents are, I don't care if they're 120 years old, when they die, you feel like, oh man, I miss them, I long for them. Can I tell you, in heaven there is no more of that, praise God. Don't ever have to worry about that ever again. That's what the Bible teaches us about heaven. So now get this. <sighs> you breathe your last breath. Immediately, hi, angels show up, taking you to heaven, overwhelming God's presence. You're flying to the northern, st- northern part of the universe. As you're flying through the northern part, guess what? You are completely aware. You understand. You know. You're knowledgeable. You know who you are, who your family is. You know all those things. You get there. Immediately upon getting there, you start immediately. I believe personally, as soon as you get there, God allows you to immediately, your family will know you're there and you get to be around your family and introduce yourself and say hi to them. And get this, you will absolutely be alive. Every fiber of your being will be alive. You will absolutely be alive from, the, from your toes to your hair. You will absolutely be alive. See, you've never experienced that. Say, but Pastor Charlie, I'm alive now. No, 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 no. Ever since the day you were born, you were born into a sinful body. A body that's contaminated by sin. So from the day that you were born, you started dying. I'm telling you, your last breath into eternity, you're alive. You're alive, alive, alive. Jesus said, he who has the son has life. Has life. You are alive, absolutely in every sense of the word. Now, check this out. Where are you going to be at? Oh, this gets good. This gets really good. You will be... In the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the city of God. Say, Pastor Charlie, does God have a city? Oh, yeah, God has a city. God lives in a city, believe it or not. And I wonder if they water the water pots at midnight like in Kokomo. But nevertheless, maybe not. I don't know. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. Here's what the Bible says. Great is the who? Is the Lord. And greatly to be praised in the what? City of our God. Listen, it isn't talking about God inhabiting a city. It says that it is the city of God. It's his city. He owns it. He runs it. He rules it. It's his city. Get this. In his holy mountain. Watch this next verse. Beautiful in. Everybody remember that word right there. Beautiful in elevation. I'll talk about that in a minute. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the where? I I thought it just said we were going north. We're going north, y'all. It's on the further sides of the north. It's on the further sides of the north. The city of our great, the city of our great king. So which direction are we going? We're going north. And where are we going? We're going to a city. We're going to a city. A city. Let me tell you a little bit about this city. Because this city is flat out awesome. You are going to absolutely love it. Yeah, there we go. Listen to this. Number one, the new Jerusalem, the city of God. The Bible tells us that it is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles high. Here to New Mexico, wide, long, deep, tall. 1,500 miles. I've heard people say, well, Pastor Charlie, you know, when we get to the pearly gates, okay, let me explain something. If you're at the gates, you're at least 750 miles away from downtown. <laughs> at least, okay, now, now, I believe most of the action is downtown where Jesus in the throne of God is, all right? So if you're out at the gates, honey, you, you like way out there. You, 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 you're out you, down the road. 750 miles out there. 
Y'all hear what I'm saying? Now, let me just give you a little bit of insight on this. Its size is the size of the moon. If you calculated the mass, that's how big it is. And now, I didn't say the planet heaven. I said heaven, the city, the main city of heaven is the new Jerusalem, and this is that city. So could the planet heaven be much larger than this? Absolutely. But heaven has a city, and that city is the new Jerusalem. It's where we were made to live. Praise God. And that city is the size of the moon for us, for us. Say anything cool about it? I personally believe it is a pyramid. I believe it is the size of a pyramid. I believe the sculpture is a pyramid. Say, how do you get there? This again, this, if we get there and it's a square, you can say, Pastor Charlie, you were wrong. And I'll say, yep, you were right, my bad. Okay, so it's not worth arguing over, but I personally believe it's a pyramid. Let me tell you why. Number one, it's only a pyramid that has a chief cornerstone. Only pyramids have that. That's number one. Jesus called the chief cornerstone. That's number one. Number two, you ready? The Giza Pyramid over in Egypt, the first pyramid built, Giza Pyramid, is actually the Bible in stone. I did a whole teaching on it before at a conference, um, but it is the Bible in stone, okay? And it is a pyramid. I personally believe that the city of God is a pyramid. If we get there and it's a cube, okay, so be it. But I personally believe it's a pyramid. How about this? It has 12 gates with the names of the tribes of Israel written on them. 12 gates. The foundations will be 12 layers to it, and its names of the 12 apostles will be written on them. The entire city will be made of gold and jewels. Gold. Gold and jewels. The Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, it's not even gold, and it's red. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Imagine a bridge like the Golden Gate being pure gold. Pure gold. Pure gold. Get this. The walls will be made of pure diamond and the city of pure gold, clear as glass, as the Bible says. Listen to this. The foundations will be filled with precious stones. As God dwells in the city, the light from his glory will shine through these stones, producing brilliant rainbows of colors everywhere. The Bible says that there's no need for the sun or the moon there. Now, some people have said, well, there's no sun or moon in heaven. That's not what your Bible says. There could be a sun and moon there, okay? But there's no need for them. Why? Because God himself lights the place up. He's got the high pro glow going on, baby. He's lighting up the whole place. Lighten up the whole place. And because everything is pure and radiant, it reflects his light and it goes all over the city. How many of you know that is awesome? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Listen to this. From God's throne flows a river of life. It will be perfect and clear as crystal. We will see God face to face in Jesus. So now get this. <sighs> Last breath. Hi, angels presence of God. You begin to move in the direction of north. You're completely aware of what's going on. Your mind is alert. You have memory. You know everything. No, no some of you know everything anyway if you're 17. But um, you're, like, you're aware of things at a greater level. You're moving in that direction. You stop and you land in a place called heaven. You're in the city of God. Pure gold all the way around you. It's a city. There are people everywhere. You recognize loved ones, friends, family. As you think about who is that, you know instantly who that is. You're learning. You're observing. You're learning. You're adjusting. You're learning as you're in heaven. As you're walking around, you look over and you see the throne of God sitting. You see God the Father sitting there. And you see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. And you see from that throne, you see a river flowing from that throne down coming through the city of God. And you can walk on the side of the river, and there, there are trees there. And the trees produce fruit for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. You can pick up a fruit, and you can eat it along the river of life, or the, the stream that's flowing from the throne of God. And you see all these living creatures in the water sitting there. And, and you're walking, and you're consuming all this. This is what it will be like. 
This is what your Bible, I'm not making this up. This is in your Bible. If you believe Jesus came and died, then you've got to believe this is what God has created for you and I. Now, the powerful part about this is to get this. How many of you got kids and you decorate the room for the kids? Anybody ever do that? Whenever we moved in our house, first thing we did is we told the kids, okay, how you want to decorate it? Michael's got military theme going on, and Whitney's got pink and stripes with white stripes going around the room. Makes me dizzy. But anyway, so, so we've got that. Let me ask you this. Why didn't we go in there and say, okay, Whitney, here's your room, baby. Here's your room. You can have, and guess what? I'm putting my deer heads in your room. Why didn't I do that? Huh? How about this? It's about her. Now hear me out. My love for her causes me to decorate it for her. Can I tell you, when we step into eternity and we're in that city, God did not create that for himself. He created it because he loved you. And he wanted you to experience all that he does just for you. He decorated the place for you. So when you get there, everything you thought would be awesome, it is. Everything that's decorated, it's, 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 it's the way God designed it for us. We will feel completely at home there. We will feel loved there. We'll feel warm. We'll feel accepted there. We'll feel like, man, this is a beautiful place. Right, because he created it just for you and I. So that we could be there and experience all that God has for us. Come on, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. See, here's the truth. I believe heaven has three great rewards, though. Three great rewards. If it, what, what's the take home today other than just understanding the process? I believe there are three great things that you should know. Number one, you should know this. In eternity future, no doubt about it, you should have no fear of death. You should have no fear of death. Now, I'm not going to deny. I'm just going to be straight. There are times where I fear death sometimes. I, I'm not going to uh, deny that. I, I will tell you this. I fear the process and the timing. Right? Yeah. But here's the truth. The Bible tells us that we should not fear death. Absolutely not. We should not walk in a fear of death. We should not walk around fearful of death. We should walk free from the fear of death. Matter of fact, saints of old believed that death was like your birthday, and they celebrated it. They didn't mourn it. They celebrated it. I can assure you of this. If I pass away tomorrow, which I'm not, I'm not going nowhere, all right? But if I pass, when I do pass away, hey, don't be sad. Throw a party. Throw a party because it's all good with me. I'm going north. <laughs> Praise God. And I'm headed to heaven, and it's okay, right? Now, I will tell you, part of my fear is the fact that I don't know anybody that's been there and came back and said, hey, man, it's cool. You know? I don't know anybody like, like, like that that, is, that has been there and came back. So, so there is the fear of the unknown. But listen, we should not live with the fear of it because we know what the Bible says. We know what the Bible teaches about the fear of death. Listen to Hebrews. It says this. Inasmuch then as we have children that are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is who? The devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy, and one of the things he did is he took death down to the grave, defeated it so that we could walk in victory over it, and we don't have to fear it ever again. Come on, amen? We don't have to fear death. We don't have to, matter of fact, everybody's done it. <laughs> I, never mind. I thought that was pretty funny. You, you, you ain't got to laugh. It's not funny when it's crickets. Chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> okay, anyway, here's the truth. You ready? Here's another verse, 2 Timothy 1.9. It says, who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ." Uh, Jesus, before time began, watch, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has what? Abolished what? He abolished it. He wiped it out. He took it and defeated it. Abolished death and brought life and what? Immortality. Life and immortality. See, when the Bible talks about you and I, when we put our faith into Christ, do you know that we bypass death? 
We bypass death. Jesus died our death so that we could step into eternal life. Oh, what a deal we get, man. So awesome. To light, uh, I'm sorry, he brought life and immortality to light through the what? Through the gospel. Absolutely, absolutely. Here's the second thing I believe that we should know and anchor into our soul whenever it comes to the idea of eternity and our future and our, and our rewards. I believe this is a huge reward. Sin is completely destroyed. Sin is completely destroyed. See, the, on our best day, on our best day, we have sinful fleshly bodies that are accustomed to this earth, right? Yes. Right, right? No matter how, listen, this body was made from the dirt, which has a curse on it. Now, watch, can God override the curse on your body? Yeah, he can heal your body, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. But at its nature, it is sinful. Right? If we say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, the Bible says. Right? So, so we have an issue. Now, there's a day coming, though, when this corruptible, sinful, will put on uncorruptible and unsinful. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, check this out. It says this, now, I, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit what? In corruption. Okay, so what happens? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. When? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet will sound for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised what? Incorruptible. Remember, this is at the rapture. You receive your glorified body. What's gonna happen? Your corruptible body will receive an incorruptible body. Praise God. At the rapture, if you're here on the earth, yeah. And we shall be what? change. We sure will. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on what? Immortality. You better believe it. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. There is a day coming where death will take its last person. Have you ever thought about that? There is a day coming where death will take out, maybe his name's Joe. Joe will be the last dude that death takes out, right? Joe, boom, done. God will say, that's it, he's done. Death has now done. Death is done. See, we think of death as being eternal, something we have to live with forever. I'm here to tell you that death, Jesus already defeated it 2,000 years ago. Yeah, amen? And so what, what can we gain out of that? We can gain the assurance that there is a day coming when death over all of our lives is defeated completely. Hmm, yeah. My goodness, that's so stinking cool. Oh, death, where is your sting? This is the next verse. Oh, Hades, where is your victory? There is none. Why? Jesus defeated it. Absolutely. So here's the next verse. The sting of death is sin. Watch this. And the strength of sin is the? Law. Listen to this. Jesus defeated death. He defeated death, and by him defeating death, he destroyed sin. Because sin is what causes death. Right? Jesus destroyed sin by destroying death. He defeated death so that sin is wiped out. So now, whenever you go to heaven, you will not have to worry about sinful thoughts, sinful ideas, sinful flesh, sin at all. I mean, I don't know about you, but there are things that I want to do that whenever I do do them, then whenever I do do them, I do them with the right attitude, but then everything I do do turns into do-do. <laughs> and then I'm mad because I'm left with the stink of the do-do that I just made. Right? right? I can't be the only one in here, praise God. <laughs> I cannot be. Uh-uh. Hey, here's the reality. The reality is, you know, sometimes things don't work out in necessarily the way we intend them to be. We might do something with the best intentions. We might do something with the wrong intentions. And we don't sometimes know the difference because this fleshly body gets in our way of deciding things. Yep. Well, I'm doing this with the right motive. No, you don't. You ain't got the right motive. Why? Everything you did turned into doo-doo, man. It's bad. Right? When you get to heaven, man... There'll be no more sinful flesh. 
I remember when, uh, uh, this is when I was teaching VBS back on base one day. This is way back whenever I first, uh, right after I got spirit filled and all this stuff. And I was teaching on base. And listen, a lot of times whenever you guys come and ask me questions, I don't fear you guys. You guys come and ask me questions all day, and I'll do my very best to get you an answer. Sometimes I don't have the, all the, I don't have all the answers, so sometimes I don't have an answer. But I'll tell you what, when I see a kid walking up with a parent, and the parent says, Pastor Charlie, my son has a question for you, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no. Because they, I'm telling you, kids can ask some questions. I'll be like, we'll have to pray about that. I don't know. <laughs> they will, man. They will. They'll ask some stuff. I remember this one kid asked the question. Here's what he asked. He said, can Satan ask for forgiveness? <laughs> Get thee behind me, little kid. <laughs> Seriously, he asked that. And I, t I looked right at him and I said, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a stinking good question. Did you get that from your mama? What are you doing? And, and, but seriously, and honestly, I pondered that for years. Literally. I'm not making this up. Literal years pondered that. Can Satan ask for forgiveness? Now, I understand enough about the Bible that he's too prideful to ask for forgiveness. But what if he did? Could he be forgiven? Took me years. It finally hit me. Finally hit me. And I'll show you what the Lord showed me about it, all right? Here's what the Lord showed me. Get this. And this ties into my message. Just follow me. Jesus came as a man. He shed his blood for man. Angel Satan is not a man. Jesus did not come to save angels. Jesus came to save man. So is there forgiveness for angels? No. Are we halfway there? Let's go a little bit further. Why is there no forgiveness for angels? Because Number one, they can appear before the throne of God day and night. They can go there right now, speed of light or faster. They can be in the throne of God. They, they are without excuse. Mankind has been separated from God for that. So when Satan stands up in heaven, in heaven, and says, I will be like him, huh, that is very different than men going, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Come on, you might know what I'm saying? Absolutely different. Lucifer deserved to be kicked out, and there is no forgiveness for him. Why? Why? Because he's an angel. He should have known better than tempting God like that. Right? So now, but for mankind, is God merciful and gracious to us? Absolutely. Why? Because mankind sinned and fell Partially because a tempter was in the air tempting man to fall and rebel against God. Y'all hear the difference? Satan rebelled with no one tempting him. Man rebelled with Satan tricking him to be tempted by God. So that's why there is forgiveness for mankind, but there is absolutely no forgiveness for angels. They should have known better. They should have known better. And that's why God is not merciful to them. And yet he is merciful to us, praise God. Say, well, Pastor Charlie, what's this got to do with us? Because, listen, the reason God is merciful uh, to us is he goes, because he knows deep within each and every one of us, if you're a believer, you want to live free from sin. I don't know about you, but I do. I want to live free. I don't want to do anything that offends God. I don't want to do anything that separates me from God or his promises. I want to do everything I can to align myself with the plan and purpose and the things of God. That's what I want to do. But I don't always do it because I don't understand maybe where I'm at or what I'm doing. Come on, right? In heaven, there'll be no more of that. No more of that. I'll be able to serve God exactly the way I want to. Praise God with a pure heart. Isn't that awesome? Sin will be abolished, absolutely. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord who? Jesus Christ. All right, third thing, and I'm done here in a minute, a couple hours. You ready? Last one, last one. Your future, I tried five different ways of saying that, but I just got to say it the way I talk, and your future is stinking awesome. Your last breath, <sighs> angels, hi, 
presence of God going north, aware of what's going on. City of God, 1,500 miles wide, tall, breath, the whole thing. You're sitting there, the river, the throne of God. You see Jesus. You see friends and loved ones, man. You see the river of God. You see the fruit. You see the trees of the, uh, uh, the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nation. You know, you see all that. You recognize sin is defeated over your life. You recognize there's no more death. You don't have to deal with any of that. And I tell you what, this is your eternal place, your eternal home, that you're in heaven with God, never to be separated from God ever again. Amen? Amen. 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 It's absolutely true. Here's what the Bible says. The path of the just is like the shining sun. That shines ever brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Let me translate that for you. Charlie Riley Amplified. Nothing gets worse than where you're at now. Nothing. Everything gets better. Everything. See, the truth of the matter is you were at your lowest before you got saved. Before you got saved. When you got saved, you came up a little. And truthfully... If you're growing in your faith, you should be coming up each and every day. Growing and growing in God. Growing. You ain't doing it all perfect, neither am I. Not doing everything perfect. Yeah, yeah. That isn't the goal. You're, you're growing. You're growing in it. And it. But at the bottom line is, I'm going to use a word that you may not appreciate, but I'm going to say it, but it still sucks. <laughs> On its best, it isn't comparing. Right. Still not everything that you desire it to be. But here's the good news. This is the lowest it gets. Because your last breath, (sighs) bam, you're in eternity. Bam, north. Wow, awesome. Future's bright, on your way. Never to be shaken by sin, sickness, disease, poverty, infirmity. Never to be separated from family, loved ones, or anything like that ever again. You're in a place with God. You're eternally, you want to go up to Jesus? Hey, Jesus, what's up, bro? Knuckle bump. And that's how it will be. You, you lie. I'm serious as I can be. You, you have that access to him. Access to him. God the Father. Hey, what's up, bro? Gabriel all right? Need anything? What's going on? <laughs> Just here to serve, God. <laughs> well, you might know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, it's going to be, don't be shocked. You get there and be like, Pastor Charlie, check this out. I did that to Jesus. I went, hey, what's up, man? (laughs) I'm telling you. Now, let me give it to you from the rapture on. All right? The path of the righteous. See, I just talked to you about during the church age, if you die, that's what happens. Now, what happens immediately after that at the rapture? You ready? So the rapture is about to happen. Okay? You're in heaven. Everybody says, "Uh uh-oh, they're about to blow the trumpet. The trumpet of God blast. What happens? You're immediately, you come above the earth and you're translated in your glorified body. Okay, Pastor Charlie, what happens next? You're immediately raptured into the air and you appear in that same city you came from for the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is a cool judgment. See, when I was a kid and I used to hear about the judgment seat of Christ, here's what I thought would happen. You ready? Here's the the way I thought it would break down. Hello, everyone. Charles Riley just showed up into heaven. Yes, Charles Riley just showed up. Charles Riley, would you make your way up here to the center of the stage? We got a big screen up here that we're going to play your life on. And all your jackups. Look, Charlie, here's where you messed it here. Here's where you jacked that up. Here's where you sinned. Everyone in heaven see this? Yeah. And by the end of it, I'm like a dirt bag. I'm like a dirt bag. I'm like, I'm like, oh, don't show them that. I didn't know y'all saw that. Oh, man. Come on, seriously? And, and, but I thought that's what the judgment seat was about. It was about Jesus showing you. Yeah, you jacked all that up, Charlie. Way to go there, pal. Trying to serve God, dirt bag. And so by the end of it, you know, I'm like in a pile of mess. Oh, God, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get in this place. I don't even know what's going on. And Jesus is going to walk over. Come on, little dirtbag. Just stand up. 
<laughs> little dirtbag, listen, here's the deal. In my mercy, I'll save you and accept you into my kingdom. And I'll be like, oh, thank you. I'm, now everybody knows I'm a dirtbag. That's how I really thought it, of it as a kid. I thought there was like a big video screen that everything I did, I really did think that. Can I assure you that is not the judgment seat of Christ? The judgment seat of Christ is where we appear before him. No one appears without the blood of Jesus being on their life, right? You're not there to account for your sins. You're there to account for the things that you've done right in your body and receive the rewards of serving Christ. So there's a crown given to you for righteousness. Yeah. There's a crown given to you if you're a martyr. Not signing up for that one, by the way. Not signing up for that one. If it happens, it happens. But here's the truth. I'm not going for that one. There is a crown. There is a crown for those who love the appearing of Christ. There's a crown. Which I've always thought is odd because that means there are some people not going to have it. So you're going to walk around heaven going, they all love to see Jesus. I didn't. (laughs) Am I picking up what I'm putting down? Awkward. Awkward. Oh, they all got a crown. They love Jesus. Look at me. I'm a dirtbag. No, it's not going to be like that, all right? So there'll be these crowns, and the Bible says that when we're given these crowns, we'll go and lay them at the feet of Jesus because the truth of the matter is we didn't deserve them to begin with, and we get to turn around and worship God and give them back to Jesus. That's what the Bible says it will do. And then guess what? We'll be there in heaven after the judgment seat. We'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is a parte, parte. Oh, Pastor Charlie, me and my buddies, we're going to go to hell and we're going to have a party. Ain't no hell in party going together. Ain't no barbecue. There is fire. You know what I'm saying? There may be a barbecue in heaven. Right? Fried chicken. But it ain't going to happen in hell. It ain't. I've heard people say that. Oh, Pastor, I'm just going to hang out with my buddies and hang out in hell. and We're just going to have a party in hell. You ain't partying in hell. It's the lake. It's fire. It's brimstone. It's where the worm dies not. It's where eternal separation and eternal fear. That's not where you want to be. You want to be there. Marriage Supper of the Lamb, second coming of Christ. Jesus gathers all the hosts of heaven. Everybody jumps on a horse, the Bible says. I'm jumping in a tea bucket, roadster, coming back to the earth. Praise God, because I don't like horses, but whatever. Uh, In coming back to the earth. And the Bible says that at that point, Jesus will set up the thousand-year millennial reign. Well, there'll be no more war, no more anything, and we will rule and reign with Christ. Then the final judgment, this is not the judgment you want to be at. This is the one that the Bible says that God opens up the book of life and the books. And whenever he opens up the books, those people that are not written in the Lamb's book of life, which I'm just going to give you a clue, no one at the final judgment, this final judgment, will be in the Lamb's book of life. No one will. The Lamb's book of life is judged here. These people that end up there, not good. They will all be brought before the Lord. And the Bible says and reads this way, and it's kind of odd, but it's what it says. It says that their lives will be read to them. And it will talk about all the things they did. And, and, and it will be said that there was no place found for them in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because God didn't make a way? No, they didn't choose Christ. And because of that, and let me just tell you as a pastor, that that bothers me more than anything as a pastor. I don't want none of y'all here. I don't want none of you here. As a pastor, my, my greatest fear is that I make it to heaven and you don't. Come on, man. Make it here. This is where it's at. Be in heaven with us. This is where it's going to be, man. Do whatever you got to do to get through this earth so that you can make it to heaven and have an eternal place with God. You don't want to be here at that final judgment because everyone at that final judgment will be thrown into the eternal lake of fire and be forever separated from God and their family and their loved ones and be bound by fear. So I just don't believe in that hell stuff. You better believe in that hell stuff, man, because it is for real. As real as there is a heaven is for real as there is a hell. For real. And then the final judgment, the Bible says then, God takes with the breath of his mouth and consumes the earth with fire and the heavens with fire. And he renovates the earth 
and heaven with fire to purify it so that we then come and live back on the earth in our new glorified bodies and the heavens are then purged of all sin. And the Bible says then, then it's all done. Then we'll live eternal, we'll live with God, forever in peace, forever with God. No more sickness, disease, poverty, infirmity, no death, no separation, none, none of the stuff that we deal with now. And I told you this is the worst it gets. Everything from here gets better, right? Okay, so let me recap and I'm done, I promise you. Here's the deal. <sighs> Bam. Hi. North. North. You're headed north. Headed north. You're aware of what's going on. You get to the eternal city. You see all that stuff. You recognize, wow, God's awesome. Look what all God did. I'm saved. I made it. My goodness, my family's here. This is awesome. This is awesome. That's my best trumpet. Trump of God. I turn around. I come back. I'm above the earth. I'm translated. I got a new body now. A perfect body. A kicking body. It's 6'4". It's awesome. Uh, Awesome. 32 years old, praise God. Strong and healthy. I'm in the sky. I go to heaven. Jesus, I stand before him, and he gives me all these treasures for things that I did by serving him. And there are some things that I did, he's like, "Ah, that didn't work, Charlie. You should have did that. But but there's no accountability of sin because sin has been done away with. And now I'm standing before him. He rewards me. I turn around and say, God, you're so good to me. Here, you take these treasures because they're really yours to begin with. And then I'm in that eternal city until Jesus wants us to return. We come back to the earth. Jesus destroys the enemy and all those who fight against him. And then he sets up his eternal thousand-year millennial reign. I'm here for a thousand years reigning with Christ on the earth, reestablishing things. After that thousand-year millennial reign, then... God says, hey, y'all, come up to my city, hang out for a little while. I want to do a renovation project on the earth. He consumes it with fire, does away with sin and everything that has to do with sin, the devil and everything. Wham, annihilates it, wipes it out, done. Sin, ever, death, gone, all of it. We knew all things are new. And now he puts us back into a new heaven and a new earth, and we're like, hi. I'm telling you, your future is awesome. Isn't that right? Isn't that awesome? Give the Lord a big clap. Praise God. (laughs) Praise God. I'm done. It says, he who overcomes shall inherit what? All things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. I know I went long, but I love this stuff. Amen?